Cards and Comics. And today I'm going to be talking about a topic that I've been thinking about since 2020, which is when the sports card market went nuts, you know, around that 2020 to 21 period, uh, the narrative from a lot of folks uh, in the hobby was that the hobby was stagnant and wasn't growing prior to 2019. And the idea that uh, it wasn't until the new collectors got in that uh, prices really escalated or the hobby growth began. So I wanted to answer the question, you know, were cards growing prior to 2020 and how fast were they? And to do that, I'm going to look at Kagers from 2014 to 2022 for a select group of cards I think represents the hobby pretty well. And I'll get into it uh, right now. Now, what I did was I just created what I call a fake card index. So I'm calling it the Cards and Comics 20 Card Index. Um, and this is really, anyone can do this with any 20 cards. So, you know, I tried to pick cards in here that either had three things to them. <laughs> One of them was, if I thought it was something that was uh, going up in value quite dramatically during that time period. So the 86, um, you know, the 86, uh, sorry, Michael Jordan uh, uh, Fleer card, the Barry Sanders PSA 10 card, the Wayne Gretzky Opeachy rookie card. And then I included cards like the 89 Upper Deck Griffey and the 9, not the 10, the 9, just to see if the 9 was growing because, in my opinion, you know, I would expect that card to be tremendously flat um, from 2014 to 2019. Um, and then I included pre war cards, 50s cards, 60s cards, 70s, 80s. So I try to run the gamut of cards, rookie cards, just playing cards, uh, to see if I could create kind of an index that captured um, what I call, you know, the majority of the market that people kind of look at when they talk about investment grade cards. Now, I broke this up into three categories. I looked at pre-2019 with a five-year Kager starting in 2014. I looked at the three-year period from 2019 to 2022. And then I combined it into one uh, eight-year Kager just to see what the average growth was for that time period, right? Now, the good thing about Kager is that it really kind of, um, it, it basically standardizes the average growth by year. That's why it's used. Um, it, it doesn't account for, um, let's say, large swings within uh, a year period because it's starting and ending. It doesn't. Uh, showcase you know wild fluctuations within that year um so it's just kind of where you started and where you ended right um and we'll show that in some slides here and some graphs so now the cards again i used um to represent it you know again the ty cobb you know, card the satchel page you know 53 tops the 52 maze card uh you know hank aaron rookie card um again these cards are designed to be in there to uh showcase you know a lot of the different hobby now going into the kager so just to kind of give you know um what i found is from 2014 to 2019 using this kind of index to kind of estimate the uh, sports card market you can see that in general most cards were growing to some level now two cards had a negative kager and that was the 71 top sturman munson and I threw that in there just because I'm getting one graded right now, and it's, it interests me, you know. Um, I'm trying to kind of dual purpose this, you know. What, what, what will happen with that card when I get it back? Is that card a card that grew tremendously during this time period, or did it decline? And it actually declined, which surprised me quite a bit. Um, the other card I threw in there just because I love the card, and it's a card that I think represents a vintage hockey, but vintage hockey that's not rookie cards. And that's a 63 Parker's Gordy Howe, my, one of my favorite hockey cards ever made. And I was shocked to see it had a negative Kager over a five-year period from 2014 to 2019. Now, you'll see that some cards had really small growth. 
you had the 52 tops Willie Mays, PSA 6, that grew less than 10%, 7.42 during that time period. While you had cards like the 58 Jim Brown that was growing almost at a 30% uh, Kager um, between that 2014 and 2019 period. So um, that's pretty good growth. That's um, what you would want out of your investment if you're trying to you know invest in a collectible. So the average for all 20 cards was around 16% with a standard EVE around 8 So you can see that in some cases, um, there's you know um, a few cards that were growing below 10, uh, some right at around 10, and then the majority are in that 15 to 20 percent range, and that shows that the market itself was doing pretty well. There was a lot of cards growing, you know, year after year, year after year, you know, um, and gaining in value. Now, when you compare that to the crazy 2019 through 22 uh, period. You can see that a lot of cards really exploded in value. Um, in the you know usual suspects like this uh, Opeachy Gretzky rookie card, which has been talked about quite a bit, but cards like the '52 Tops Willie Mays and the '53 Satchel Page and the '52 Tops Jackie Robinson all grew tremendously during this time period as well. Now, there's cards that surprise me in terms of just co in comparison, right? So. Uh, the Ty Cobb at 45.87, the uh, Hank Aaron Rookie PSA 6 at 45. Um, you know, those two cards surprised me. The Ted Williams at 46%, right? That, you know, was very interesting to me that some cards weren't growing at such a tremendous rate during this time period. And I'll get into that a little bit into why I think some cards um, in the vintage world um, grew and didn't grow at, at uh, higher rates than others, right? But if you look at the overall uh, eight-year Kager, you can see that the average, you know, went from you know, 16 to 29, so almost double um, during that time period. So a three-year run of cards almost doubled the average Kager for all cards, uh, just showing you the tremendous impact of that three-year period. Now, but you know, the big thing that we're all wondering right now, as we talk about you know card values and what's happening in the market, is what does this mean for the future? You know, um, how does this af affect, you know, what we you know, invest in and, and what we can expect um, if I'm in, you know, in this card market heavily, right? So I'm going to get into some very specific cards and uh, just talk about it and show you some graphs to kind of lay it out and a more visual representation here. So first up is the 52 Tops, uh, Willie Mays, and a PSA 6. And I try to choose cards that had uh, a lot of um, sales for one thing, to get a good uh, um, valuation and um, enough data. But this card, more than any of them, shows that tremendous uh, linear growth over um, a short amount of time. And it's very stark. And you can see um, the chart on the left shows 2014 through 2019. And I blew that up a little bit to show you that even though it's a 7.42% Kager over that, uh, five-year period you can see starting you know around 16 uh, and 17 you did see a bump in value of the cards and so you did see some growth there you saw some wild swings where certain auctions and certain cards did bring a uh, tremendously amount uh, higher than the average uh, price for that card and that shows you that you know kangers can't show you those little spikes you know it's it's it kind of averages everything out now Looking at 2019 through 22, you can see when you uh, cut the tail, which is that, you know, 2014 through 2018, you can see right around, um, you know, June of 2020, a tremendous spike in the price of this card. Um, and it's, it is linear. It just goes up, you know, from a base, you know, um, you know, w around what, three, you know, 35, dollars 3, dollars to, over twenty thousand dollars just like overnight just just crazy you know that doesn't happen and then you see the card slowly decline and now it's slowly going back up again so this card really hasn't shown a lot of vulnerability um in the last three years it's hanging out there you know with some of its previous high so um you know in general what i would think about this card is that it was underpriced um, now, was it worth 20000 versus 4000 
I would say it was underpriced. That's all I would say is it was underpriced along with all Willie Mays cards. And I said that uh, many times in many videos. So uh, it's a consistent message I've been putting out there is that Willie Mays cards were just tremendously undervalued um, for what his you know, status as a player was. And um, they're correcting. And so this card corrected. It's not going back down like some other cards um, during this time period. And again, it's a strong indicator that, uh, that you know, cards like this will continue to grow in value because they always have um, over uh, a period of time. Now, next up is the Jim Brown. And so this was a card that grew tremendously during the 14th through 19th period. In fact, it was on my list. It was the highest growth card during 2014 through 2019 on average, 29.46. Um, almost at the same uh, rate as the entire index um, if you take in the whole eight years. So this car was growing at the index rate um, for all eight years in the low growth period uh, pre-2019. So I think that is, shows you that this card was gaining in value. And you can see the spikes and volatility of this card. As, and um, you know the biggest thing with this card... This is why um, you can't treat uh, sports cards, comic books, as as uh, commodities, right? You know, when you when you uh, trade stocks, no one cares what the stock looks like. In tr in sports cards, comic books, money, and currency, um, even in the same grade, there's tremendous difference in how the card looks, right? And I would say that a lot of times these spikes in the in the card value. Uh, that you see here, this really spiky graph is sometimes the card is kind of ugly. It's off center. It's missing um, the eye appeal. It's out of focus. And but when a card comes in very centered with very clean uh, aspects of the card, you know, white borders, um, not out of focus, this card will spike and sell for more because it just looks nicer, right? This is a card that has tremendous variation in eye appeal in the same grade. And so you're seeing that spikiness there. Now, you can see, obviously, that 2020 through 2021 spike. It's not quite as linear as the uh, Willie Mays card, the 52 tops. But you can see that its average Kager from 2014 through 2022 uh, was very high, um, almost 40%. And, um, but you can see it's gotten through some really tough volatility as well. You can see it just spiking up and down like crazy, even after 2021. And again, I think this card is one of those cards that is very susceptible to eye appeal. And that wild swing in value is really that eye appeal issue, right? So this is a card that you would only invest in, in my opinion, um, if you're going to spend you know, $15,000 on this card, it better look really, really nice in this grade. Now, the Parkour Scordy Hound, this is kind of the wild card I threw in there, and that's why I want to talk about it a little bit is this card had a negative Kager from 14 through 19. And I think it just speaks to, in general, vintage hockey cards. Um, and to me, vintage hockey cards are uh, a very much of an untapped market. Um, for one thing, they have tremendous eye appeal, um, but they have tremendous amount of unknown players as well. Uh, a lot of Hall of Famers that people don't really recognize. I'd say like that common collector, but Gordy Howe, everyone sh you know pretty much knows. I think he's one of the most um, um, let's say respected and, and known names in, in the uh, hockey vintage arena. And this card is to me one of the you know um, best looking cards that's been made of hockey cards. And I, I just think the flag behind um, him is just you know, one of these cards that just has tremendous eye appeal, right? And this card has always had, you know, kind of this, you know, uh, aura around it, you know, this eye appeal, right? Now, but, you know, I think vintage hockey cards, you know, have always kind of taken a back seat. And so this negative K here does re reflect how the market treats vintage hockey cards. And I think even though you see this spike, you know, the 68.16, you know, K here from 19 through 22, uh, and you can see sort of some spikes. You see it's it's spiking but down, up, down, you know, and probably, again, not a lot of sales, but also, you know, IPO may be affecting it. But, you know, overall, um, I think this is a card and, and, and kind of a, indicative of, the, of its uh, market, which is vintage hockey, that has some tremendous upside, in my opinion, still. 
because they didn't really spike um, like everything else um, did around that 21, 22 time period. Uh, next up, you know, I talk about the Ty Cobb, Red Portrait, the Piedmont, uh, Sweet Caparole, which is the common back for the T206 set. So this is kind of common. You know, even though the red is a tremendous eye appeal, it's become kind of the most popular card because it's the most available. Um, that's one thing you got to remember. The red cob is pretty much the most available cob card out there. Um, and um, it's it, you know, when you get a really nice uh, red um, background, it looks it looks tremendous, right? Now this card was growing at twenty point nine three during fourteen through nineteen. Um, and you can see um, a spike around eight, you know, between 18 uh, and 19, and it kind of stayed flat. And that's why, you know, you can see even when you blow it out to 19 through 22, it had a couple spikes, but it flattened out. And again, um, its overall Kager from 19, or sorry, from 14 through 22 is not that much higher than it was through 14 through 19. So you can see that the spike didn't really affect this card as much. And again, if you look at the chart, um, the 41 play ball Ted Williams also did not really spike at all during this time period um, compared to everything else. So I do think pre-war cards didn't spike as hard. Uh, maybe there were some, you know, the value was always there. But I think this pre-war cards were, especially from certain sets like play ball, the, uh, the uglier sets. But I think there was a sort of idea around these low grade because you cannot find PSA 10 or PSA 9 T206s or 41 play balls. They're just very, not, they're very rare, not common. And I just think like in that collector time period, when everything was spiking so high, people were shooting for these higher grades. And I don't think they understood uh, the T, the, the, sorry, the pre-war cards and what was considered high end for those cards. And I think it's very common when I talk to collectors, uh, younger collectors, at shows and just you know they just don't understand these cards they don't understand there's a lot of work that goes into understanding this market they understood easier the basketball and the modern market and so they just didn't really get into it and i think that's why this market is a little bit under uh under um let's say valued and to some extent compared to how hard other things spiked so there's some potential here for pre-war cards i think in the future to, to, to continue to grow and still be uh, a little bit undervalued. Now, again, what does it all mean? So um, I like to, you know, when I talk about um, pricing and mostly when I talk about pricing, I talk about vintage cards. Um, you know, according to my index, I created that, you know, majority cards were growing prior to 2019. I think you could take any 20 vintage cards that are good cards, take Hall of Fame rookie cards, take, take, you know, um, vintage you know, basketball cards, vintage uh, football cards, even other hockey cards, you'll find that a lot of them were growing. Um, you'll find that, you know, that 15% number probably is fairly accurate if you just take, you know, another set of cards, you know. Um, now, you know, that 16% Kager, if you compare it to the last five years of cryptocurrency, you know, when I looked it up, it was 11.1 .1 Kager for the last five years. So that, you know, pre-19 uh, card value was pretty good. I think for people who invested, they were happy. I think it does kind of um, take the narrative away that that people weren't uh, seeing cards val card values going up, that people were unhappy with how the market was and that all the new money and new people came in and saved the card market. I just think that's just a false narrative. None of that was really true. Um, the cards did spike in price, but it just made the collectors and the people who were buying those cards prior just have to pay more. But it wasn't like people were like thinking that the market was tanking or or that um, they were you know that nothing was worth anything. Um, car cards were going up in value um, at a pretty good clip. Now, not as crazy as it was in 19 through 22, but we know that's not sustainable. Um, now, one thing that you have to remember is that the difference between 14 and 19 and 19 through 22 is that the rate of growth during that time period was dependent on the card. Not all cards were growing at the same rate. 
or uh, going up at all. We saw some negatives, right? And that's going to be the future. That's going to, you know, not all, not everything's a winner, right? And I just mentioned, you know, hockey and pre-war cards. You know, I, I'll say it again a little later, but, you know, again, if you go out and invest in those markets, you might find that for the next five years, they don't grow. They don't do anything, right? Because that's just not how the market really works. It doesn't always go up. And you might be early. And then, let's say, in five years from now, there's a big growth in vintage hockey. You know, who knows? That could happen. And you got in early, right? Like Marvel car guys did, maybe like uh, soccer car guys did early, uh, earlier in 21 and 22, right? And that's, that's what people play. That's what the game some folks play. But it won't be every card, and there'll be winners and losers, right? So if you just go out and buy any vintage Hall of Fame rookie card, you may find um, some of them won't grow. And that's going to be the future. They're not going to grow at double, quadruple the rate like they did in 19 through 22. Uh, there will be winners and losers. Now, again, some cards were truly undervalued. The Satchel Pages, the Willie Mays cards, the Jackie Robinson cards. They had tremendous uh, upside because they were super important cards of players who were very important. Uh, who didn't have a lot of cards. And like Satchel Page and Jackie Robinson doesn't have a tremendous amount of cards. And so the ones they do have were undervalued in my opinion come from very tough sets, come from sets that are hard to find um, and a harder grade. And so the high grade cards for those sets in that player should have been the cards that gone up in value the most, in my opinion, and, and they did. Uh, and again, I'll say it again, Willie Means was just tremendously undervalued um, compared to what his plain you know, uh, statistics um, were worth. Uh, and so I think it's just a natural correction. Um, some cards are going to continue to go down. And you know, the market's going to correct and some cards are going to go down. Some cards are going to flatten. Some cards will, will, will go up. And again, it'll be, tr be based on other market dynamics. It could be based on attractiveness. It could be based on uh, the player uh, who's popular. You know, um, you know, I, I saw where Larry Doby, you know, during the Jackie Robinson day was getting a lot of love and his cards went up a little bit. You just never know, right? And so I think this is where everyone has to kind of say, look, you know, there are going to be cards that lose value over five the next five year period. Some are going to gain. And again, some markets will continue to gain in value um, <laughs> as the market corrects. Right. And, you know, pre-war and, and vintage hockey are two areas I, I see as being kind of uh, undervalued and to some extent, uh, especially based on the last eight years. Now, so in summary, you know, of, of what all this means is that, um, A, you know, it's not going to go to zero. <laughs> There's still going to be things growing, even if it's at a smaller rate. That's what the market's shown us, you know, for the last eight years. And I, I could go back even further, but, you know, I just wanted to prove a point that, you know, that prior to 2019, that the, the market wasn't just flat or, or negative for, for cards. Um, but it just also says that the future growth rate maybe closer to 10 to 15 percent not you know 150 you know not uh you know 85 you know 10 to 15 and if you're okay with that if you're okay with that level then by all means get in if you're looking to double triple your money in a very short time period i think right now it's not the time i think there's other things you need to look at but if you're in it um, wanting to make a little bit of money over time. This is still a great market to be in and it's fun and it's a hobby still, but you know, I don't think that we're going to, you know, see these kind of crazy prices for, for, for a while, maybe not again in the next 20 to 40 years, who knows, but this small growth over time, that 10 to 15% rate for these very important cards, I think that's almost guaranteed. So um, there it is, guys. I just want to you know, talk about this a little bit, uh, dispel the rumor or the myth about what was happening before 2019, and just put it out there that, you know, it's still great, you know, I, I won't call it investment, but it's still something that if you're really interested in and you wanted to make this a hobby and, 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 and park some money into some, some cards and get that 10 to 15% growth maybe year over year, you know, you this is still a good place to do it, so... There it is, guys. Let me know what you think in the comments. Um, let me know uh, what cards you would like to see an index made out of. Did you like my index? Do you think it was kind of a self-serving index of cards I already have, which in some cases it is. 
Um, but yeah, let me know what you think, and I'll talk to you next time on Cards and Comics. Bye.